So I had a couple conversations with some coworkers about records recently, and it got me thinking about some of the lessons that I've learned as a record collector over the years. And so I thought I'd pass them along for what it's worth. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Northern Revolutions. I'm Rob, welcome back if you're returning. Welcome if you're new. As I mentioned off the top, um, a couple of conversations with uh, two coworkers recently at a trade show uh, about record collecting. Uh, one of the coworkers, slightly older than me, interested in getting into records. The other coworker, 20 years older than me, still has all his records, still has his turntable, they're all in storage. And he was surprised to hear that vinyl is a thing again. And so it sort of got me thinking about, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, which is frightening to think. So I'm gonna share with you six things that I've learned that I think are worthy of passing on to newcomers to the vinyl collecting world. Number one, and I think this is the most important, buy, what you're going to listen to, not what you think you should own. I mean, I know that sounds uh, kind of silly. Of course, you're going to buy what you're going to listen to. But, you know, I know some people that, you know, have started to get into records and they've said, well, I've got to buy this album because everyone says that's a great album and you're supposed to own it. Or, you know, I want to have this record in case someone comes over and I can show them I have this record. I mean, I think that came up in a in a, in, in a thread somebody had done or something recently. Listen, do what you want. It's your money. The purists would say, well, you, you, you must have Dark Side of the Moon. It's one of the greatest albums ever. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely fantastic. I have it. And I listen to it from time to time. I have it because it was in my dad's collection. And... I like it. The concept of, 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 you know, buying an album because you should own it to be a music fan. That's crazy. You know, there's all those lists that are the greatest albums of all time. You know, the 50 records you must hear before you die. Yeah, listen to them. Great. Do you need to own them? If you like them, sure. But don't own them because you're not a real record collector if you don't have Dark Side of the Moon. That's horse crap buy what you're going to listen to. Records aren't cheap. Records also take up a lot of space. So buy what you're going to listen to. The whole point of having records is to listen to them. It's a way to experience the music. So buy what you're going to listen to. Number two is kind of related to that, actually. Ignore the snobbery. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of that in the record collecting world. I see it on YouTube. I really do. There are factions out there in the vinyl community. There are people making videos and, you know, there's stuff that it's not cool to like. And the other thing I think about, there are some record stores that are snobby. In fact, there is a record store in the city that I live in. I won't name it. And it is run by the most snobby, pretentious douchebags I've ever met in 30 years of collecting records. They will not stock stuff that is commercial because if it's commercial, it's not good. Guess what, dickhead? If it wasn't for the commercial stuff, you wouldn't be selling records. So get your head out of your butt. Like what you like. Who cares if it's popular to like something? Who cares if, you know, the guy in the Iron Maiden t-shirt behind the counter of your local record store kind of chuckles because you want a Nickelback record. Hey, I don't like Nickelback, but that's because I don't like their music. If you want to like Nickelback, great. If you get enjoyment from it, that's all that matters. Don't give a crap what other people think, especially the snobs at some of the record stores. I'm not saying all record stores are like that. There are other record stores that are absolutely fantastic. 
but there are also some that are kind of snobby. And there are certain elements within the vinyl community that look down on things that are commercial. Hey, that's their point of view. My old man used to say, opinions are like buttholes. Everybody has one. Like what you like. Listen to what you like. I'll give you some examples. It's not cool to like Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. Because it's the most overplayed album ever. Yeah. It's 21 times platinum. Has sold 42 million copies worldwide. Because it is a goddamn good record. It is one of my favorite records of all time. Is it cool to like this? Not according to some people. Certainly not the snobby record store in my hometown because it's too commercial. Oh well, I enjoy this record immensely. Shania Twain's coming over. Again, it's 20 times platinum. It sold 40 million copies worldwide. I think it is the most successful country album by a female singer ever. Is it cool to like this? Absolutely not. Do I care? Not one little bit. This was all over the radio when I was a teenager in the 90s, or I guess I was maybe in university, whatever. It's a great record. Mutt Lang, awesome producer, worked with Def Leppard. Nothing wrong with this record. Do I care that it's not cool to like it? Absolutely not, because I enjoy the hell out of this album. Speaking of Mutt Lang, it is very uncool to like Brian Adams. Everyone shits on Brian Adams. I don't get it. Love Brian Adams. Does he have a lot of schmaltz and cheese? Yeah, but he also has some really great songs as well. Unabashedly, Brian Adams fan. Love him. Is it cool to like him? Absolutely not. This is one I hear a lot in the violent community. Aerosmith. You can't like Aerosmith from the 80s and 90s because it sucks. Only the 70s Aerosmith is good. Is the 70s Aerosmith good? Yeah, it is. They are absolutely amazing. Toys in the Attic, phenomenal. But this was my Aerosmith from 1993 when I was 14, 15, whatever the hell I was. This was the Aerosmith that I grew up with and I love it. It is not cool to like 90s Aerosmith, but I don't care. I derive such enjoyment from this period of Aerosmith. Buy what you like. Listen to what you like. Ignore the snobbery. Number three, FOMO is not real. What's FOMO? FOMO is the fear of missing out. I think uh, the record labels like to feed on the FOMO thing and Record Store Day especially is driven by FOMO. Um, you know, putting out these limited releases and I, I, I gotta buy it or else I'm never gonna see it again. That's not really true. And I'll give you some examples. One of the first times I sort of experienced FOMO was uh, Record Store Day in, I want to say like 2010, something like that. The first time that The Last Waltz by the band was reissued, and it was a limited edition. They numbered it. This one happens to be number 3740 of 5,000. There's only 5,000 of these, and if you don't get it, you're going to miss out. And I didn't find it on Record Store Day. Uh, I did actually pick up a copy on uh, eBay sometime later. It has a little bit of damage at the top, a seam split, but I got it at a really reasonable price. But that's not the point. This album, which is I, it, which was uh, remastered by Robbie Robertson in uh, 2002 or something like this, this has been repressed so many times since this first record store day reissue. I mean, it's been almost yearly that this has been repressed. It is very easy to find a modern remastered repress of the band's last waltz. So the only thing different is that this one has a number that says X of 5,000. Who cares? The queen of fostering FOMO, Miss Taylor Swift. And I fell victim to this instance of FOMO. When she put out her album Midnights in 2022, she released the original version of the album. And then on her website, I don't know, a week or so later, she had for 48 hours only, or maybe it's 24 hours only, there were three alternate cover variants, alternate uh, vinyl colored pressings, and the back made the rest of the clock 
So you put all four together and made a clock face. And I thought, well, that's kind of clever. It's 24 hours only or 48 hours only, whatever it was. So I bought them. This one, this one, this one. They all have names like mahogany something and whatever. I don't know what the hell each variant is called, nor do I care. And so I, you know, I bought them and, you know, that's fine. Cool. Not because, I guess not because I was afraid of missing out. I didn't really care. I had the first version of the album. But that was kind of neat. Limited time only, like I said, 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever it was. And then like a month later, by popular demand, it's back indefinitely. And I was a little pissed off, actually, because in my mind, that was almost false advertising. You know, capitalizing on, you know, everyone knows Swifties tend to be a little bit crazy. You know, I'm a Swifty too, but I, I don't think I'm a crazy one. Except maybe in this case, I guess, because I bought the damn records. But the capital, whether it was her or her label, I don't know. Wanted to capitalize on the, the fear of missing out. So you can only get these today. And then a month later, they're available again, indefinitely. I'll give you one more Taylor Swift example. Up until recently, probably the hardest to find Taylor album, Long Pond Studio Sessions for Folklore, was a record straight A release, limited pressing. I got one of these, thanks to John, my buddy. Picked one up at his local store and shipped it to me. Very expensive for the last, uh, when did this come out? 2020, 2022. So for the last two years, this has been pretty expensive. You know, three, four, five hundred bucks, depending, which is crazy. But now you can order these again. Taylor Swift's web store in China has repressed this, so you can go on and order it right now and buy it. So sort of capitalized on the, the, the fear of missing out to get people to buy this on Record Store Day. Number four is kind of related to that. It kind of segues nicely, actually. Number four, everything gets reissued for the most part. If there's money to be made, they're not just going to sit on something. They may sit on it for a while, but everything eventually gets reissued. I'll give you a few examples. This is U2's Best of 1990 to 2000, which came out in 2002. This is an original pressing. This is pretty expensive. This is U2's Best of 1980 to 1990, which also came out in that same year. This is a reissue. I bought the other one, 1990 to 2000, when it came out, but I couldn't find one of these at the time. And I looked for years and years and years on eBay, and occasionally they would pop up and they would be two, three hundred dollars, and I wasn't paying that because I thought that was ridiculous. And then about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, I guess, the entire U2 catalog was reissued on vinyl, including this. So do I care that it's an original? Absolutely not. Aside from Probably a matrix number that's different. You couldn't really tell the difference. And I don't really care. I just wanted the record. So I had to wait, you know, 12 or 15 years, but this got reissued. Another one, Cheryl Crow's Tuesday Night Music Club. Came out on a record store day release, I want to say around 2016-ish, somewhere around there. And I wasn't able to find one. And then they were on sale on eBay and Discogs, a couple hundred dollars. Wasn't going to pay that. <laughs> a few people, <clears throat> Chance, John, David, like to rub it in my face that they had this. And I didn't. And that's fine. I figured, well, at some point in time, it's got to get repressed. It's arguably her biggest selling album. They're not going to sit on it. And they didn't, because just this year, I guess last year, it was remastered, repressed. Here it is. So, yeah, I had to wait, I don't know, six, seven years, whatever it was. But it was reissued, and it cost me, for argument's sake, $40 as opposed to $250. I'm okay with that. This last example was a thorn in my side for a long time. Fleetwood Mac did a series of alternate uh, versions of albums from sort of the Rumors era lineup. 
So you had alternate Fleetwood Mac, alternate Rumors, alternate Tusk, alternate Mirage, alternate Live, and lastly, alternate Tango in the Night. Some of these I picked up when they came out. Some of these I grabbed off eBay or Discogs. But one of them eluded me, and that was Alternate Tusk. Saw it twice in a record store. $250. Wasn't happening. And I thought, man, what am I going to do? I've got the rest. I've got everything Fleetwood Mac put out. Big Fleetwood Mac fan. All layers of the band. I really need this. And I didn't think I was going to be able to get it. And then on record store day, maybe three years ago, I think, they reissued these as a box set on colored vinyl. And I had one in my hand and I didn't buy it because I only needed this one. And I thought, well, I'm going to keep looking. And eventually I did get one of these off eBay. I know it looks like someone's scribble on it that's actually autographed by the photographer who is Jamie Odgers. Apparently he signed this. So whatever. I don't really care. I was able to eventually find one on eBay for a pretty reasonable price, actually, because they came down a little bit when they were reissued. The point is, I didn't know that I was... I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get them all, but they did get reissued. And you know what? Worst case scenario, I would have sold off the ones that I had and bought the box set if I couldn't find Tusk. But they eventually got reissued. I mean, that's not to say that that's going to happen 100% of the time. You know, my want list over the last decade, there's two or three albums that have remained on that want list because they haven't been reissued yet. But I think they they have to be at some point in time. Number five is an adage that I have heard other folks use in the Vonda community. There are no rare records, only expensive records. And that's absolutely true. With the advent of eBay and Discogs, you can literally find anything. There are no rare records anymore. How much you're going to pay for it, you know, that's that's the catch. Records that are harder to find obviously are going to demand a premium. But it's not like in the 90s where you had to hope you could find it in a record store or at a record show. And there was as many record shows in the 90s as there is nowadays. If I wanted to get a, a UK white album back in the 90s, that would have been a bit of a challenge. Now... You go on eBay and there's a ton of them listed. You're going to pay for them, but they're there. So my piece of advice with that is, and I'm a <laughs> big proponent of doing this, I like to window shop on eBay and Discogs. I keep looking for certain records and you look long enough and you'll find them at a price you're willing to pay. A couple examples. Jolly What, The Beatles and Frank I feel which was released on VJ Records in the U.S. Uh, before Capital started putting out Beatles records. I <laughs> wanted this for a long time because I am a Beatles completist. Uh, and it took me a long time of looking for this, uh, probably a decade, till I found one that I was you know, willing to pay the amount they wanted for. Could you get one of these for 400 bucks? Yeah, probably. I wasn't paying 400 bucks. Um, I was able to, and I don't remember exactly what I paid for this, but it was right around about 100 bucks. Uh, just because right place, right time, that's what someone asked, and uh, that's what I was able to get it for. This one kind of goes along with the, the previous topic about everything being reissued. I really wanted a copy of the Goo Goo Dolls Dizzy Up the Girl. And... The first pressing of this was, uh, I want to say 2014, 2015, something in that neighborhood. And then there was a later record start a release. I wanted either one of them, and they were both very expensive. And when I say very expensive, you know, if I were to grab one off eBay at the typical, you know, find one every couple months for sale. By the time I bought it in U.S. dollars, converted to Canadian, paid uh shipping to get it up here you got zinged with duties and whatever you know it would have been 
$250, $300, which I was not prepared to do. So every week when I was bored, I'd look on eBay. I keep looking, I'd keep looking. And I finally got this. This is the original pressing. Um, I got it because it has a tiny, tiny little crease in the bottom corner. Do I care? Not one bit. I'm not one of these. It has to be mint. The record's mint. The jacket has one little crease on the, tiny little crease on the back. I don't care. I picked this up for like 75 bucks. So I was thrilled. I waited long enough. I kept looking. I got it. Ironically, two months after I snagged my original first press, this was reissued and now you can get it for like 30 bucks. I kind of wish that I would have just, you know, I kind of wish I wouldn't have found this so that I could have picked up the $30 one. But hey, I have an OG, so. And the last one that I'll give you an example of, there's no rare records, only expensive records. Oasis Be Here Now, big Oasis fan. Was a fan from What's the Story, Morning Glory onward. The original UK pressings, by all accounts, sound incredible and i would like them because they're you know they're the they're the original pressings from their home country i have the very first reissues of all the albums but i would really like a first press of definitely maybe what's the story of morning glory and be here now and i looked and looked and looked and occasionally you find them on ebay getting them here canadian dollar shipping you know duties 300, 400 bucks. It's insane. But I looked long enough and I got myself this. This is an original 1997 first pressing of Be Here Now. And I think I got it for like 75 bucks. Maybe the seller didn't know what they had. I did. And there was enough information from the pictures and the description to know what I had. And sure enough, when I got it here and it arrived here, yes, it, it is indeed what I thought it was. So uh, again, probably 10 years of looking on eBay and Discog still I got this. I'm still on the hunt for a definitely maybe and what's a starting morning glory that I'm willing to pay the asking price for. Who knows if that'll ever happen, but I waited long enough and at least I got this one. And the last thing I want to mention, number six, new is sexy, but don't ignore used. There is so much new vinyl out there now. You can go to your Walmart, if you're in the US, because Walmart Canada doesn't do records. You can go to your Barnes and Noble, your Target. We don't have Target or Barnes and Noble. You can go to your big box stores and you can find records. You go into record stores nowadays and you know half of it is new or more in some cases. There's one of my favorite record stores that I go to is 95% new vinyl, and that's great. New vinyl is sexy. Don't ignore old vinyl. And the reason I say that is, there's a lot of great used vinyl out there. And in a lot of cases, there's nothing different between the new vinyl and the old vinyl, except one rolled out of the plant six months ago and one rolled out of a pressing plant 20 years ago. I could see you know, new vinyl that's maybe heavyweight or there's bonus tracks, you know, whatever. Cool. Get that. But, you know, I think of, for example, example I use, and I was talking to my wife about this earlier tonight, ACDC's Back in Black. You can go buy a brand new pressing of it. Maybe it sounds better than one from 30 years ago. I don't know. You could go into a used record store and they probably have it. So do you want to pay $10 for a reasonable used pressing? Or do you want to pay $30, $35 for the exact same thing except brand new? My point is, don't ignore used records. You gotta be mindful of the condition because you don't wanna buy something that's scratched all to hell. But while you know it might be attractive to, let's get this something new and, and shiny and pretty with no creases or no ring wear. If you're in it to listen to it, find some used stuff. Because you can buy one new record or you can probably buy five used records. It's up to you, but don't ignore used records. There are, you know, six things that I've learned over the 30 years that I've done this that I think are worthy of passing on to somebody new in the hobby. 
that's everything for me today, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, what are some lessons you'd like to pass along to some, some newcomers to this crazy hobby of ours? Drop it in the comments. I'd love to hear what everybody has to say. Thank you for watching. Catch you on the flip side.